We're doing our tour through the Gospel of Mark, and today we're going to be in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. It's good, by the way, to be back. I know uh, Paul did such an awesome job, and, and Pastor Tim the Sunday before. It's good to be, good to be back. You know, uh, I forgot to tell on Sunday, but you know a vacation is good because it was more of a staycation, you know, one of those. But you know they're good when you have to ask each other what day it is. That's, that's our measure for a good vacation is if you don't know what day it is, nice job. And we got that a couple of times, so praise the Lord. Okay, so Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 33, and I have entitled this evening's message, Seeing in Stages. Seeing in Stages. So yesterday I was, let's see, watching the news. I was at the gym on the treadmill, and they got these TVs up there, and you got like every single news channel possible. And on two of them, let's see, I think one of them was Fox and one of them was CNN. You know, those guys, they're like, like this all the time. And it was really interesting because of now all that's going on and the allegations about uh, President Trump and he's trying to, you know, uh, saying, could you just excuse this guy and let stuff happen? And I'm not getting into the politics of it, okay? The point, though, is this. I noticed that each side, if you want to call them sides, accuses the other side of not actually seeing the truth, being blind to the truth, or intentionally turning away from the truth. The problem is that they say that the other person is intentionally lying. They actually go that far rather than simply saying, well, you know, they're just not seeing the truth right now. But what stuck was the idea of truth and the idea that we are called to see it, right? I mean, truth is, and we are supposed to pursue what is we serve a God, and that God is a God of truth. We have a message called the gospel, and that gospel message is worthy of sharing and following because it is a message of truth. Truth matters. But sometimes it uh, takes some guidance. It takes some direction. It takes some instruction to be able to follow this truth. It takes somebody perhaps to lead you there, or perhaps you're on your way, but there is yet more that you will be following. Nevertheless, you get the point that the truth is what matters, and we are called to follow after it. Now, in this evening's study in Mark chapter 8, it is such, you guys, such a marvelous way of the Lord kind of letting us be a part of this unfolding of the truth and watching it in a way where God's people will go after it, but we also know that there is more to go after. It's like we get it's a ride along. And, of course, it has such personal application for all of us because you and I, we, beloved of God, we are constantly studying, right? We are praying. We, we come here to these Bible studies because we want to know it and we want to live it and we want to do it for the glory of the Lord. We're going to get into Mark chapter 8 in just a moment. I want to uh, lead us in a prayer, okay? And then we'll go for it. Would you bow your heads now? Let's, uh, let's make this happen. Lord, we do want to just uh, pursue your amazing truth. And this evening, we are thankful that you've given us this time to do it, Lord, in this gospel, the gospel of Mark. Lord, here in chapter 8, and we pray, uh, Holy Spirit, that you would just fall afresh upon each, each and every one of us. Uh, Lord, that our hearts are like moist clay and you're just going to mold us and shape us. Lord, that you're going to, you're going to please Holy Spirit, that you're going to give us the ability to not just discern, not just understand, Lord, but even greater to put what we understand into practice, uh, that you may be glorified. 
Lord, that uh, others may see the truth and uh, through us because we know the truth will set them free. And so we're thankful. We praise you together. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in verse 22 is where we start. This is Jesus and his men having just left a group of Pharisees that basically confront Jesus. And they say, you know, show us a sign after all that he's done. And Jesus basically looks at them, shakes his head, turns around and says, guys, let's get out of here. Enough is enough. And so we pick up in verse 22 in Mark chapter 8. Notice it just tells us where they came. Bethsaida. Then they came to Bethsaida. Now that is an area where, well, it's, it's a fisherman's area. Peter, James, John would all be from this particular area. Uh, it was a pretty big city, pretty reasonably sized city back then. And it was a place where, you remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? It was right near there. We know from the scriptures that Jesus did a lot. He, he well, he did what only Jesus could do. Performed many, many miracles. But here's the deal. They said, no go, Jesus. Thanks, but no thanks, Jesus. And so what does Jesus do in response? Oh, man, you don't want to be one of these towns. This is Luke chapter 10. He goes, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Yikes. I hope Prescott is never there on that list of towns that Jesus goes, woe to you. Um, too bad, because Jesus was saying this, it should have been obvious, huh? Don't you, doesn't that break your heart? Because you know that Jesus should be obvious to so many, and they just turn their backs to him. And this is kind of what Jesus has experienced personally. But this is what's so cool about this. Just, you know what? Just grasp what happens next. Look, verse 22. It says, And some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. Verse 23. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. So Jesus cursed this place. Nevertheless, Jesus came back to this place. You know what that demonstrates to us? God is in love with people, isn't he? He's not in love with regions or towns. He is in love with people. And even though this was sort of that blanket rebuke, it does demonstrate this, that even though he does pronounce doomsday on, the, on that area, he will never reject ministering to a person, no matter where that per person is. It doesn't matter what darkness that person is in. It doesn't matter what sin that person is in. Have you ever talked to somebody, or maybe you've been this person, where you've said, it's been too bad. Like if you knew the region that my life is in right now, and the sin that I've committed, or somebody you know saying that to you, listen, Jesus doesn't care about the darkness of the region. He cares about the heart. He cares about the person in that darkness. And so he actually says, woe to you, like a few towns that he actually rebukes. But he says, you know what? I'm going back there anyway. Because I know there's a person who needs me. What a, what a sweet time. How about in the Old Testament? You remember when God promised the people that they were going to conquer the land? One of those places was Jericho. So there's a prostitute, and her name is Rahab. And she lives there, and she basically kind of helps these people and says, hey, look, look, listen, could you do this, though? When you come back and you conquer the city and you burn it down with fire, could you kind of spare me and spare my family? And what happens? 
So God calls them to conquer the town, conquer the city, burn it down, get rid of everybody. But there was that prostitute in her family that God said, you know what, spare her and spare them. This is a lesson of the God of love and truth for every one of us, no matter what darkness we are in or what darkness we need to come out of. So it goes on in verse 23 now. So here you go. So the heart is Jesus and people. All right, verse 23. And when he had spit, <laughs> that's what makes me laugh every time. And when he had spit on his eyes, when he hocked a couple of loogies and spit them in the guy's eyes. I know, that was a little gross. Okay, hold on. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him. The, the, the point, okay, we laugh at this. But do you remember when we talked about this before? The lesson was that God just knows you. Huh? God knows me, and what's right ministry for me is not going to necessarily be right ministry for you. And what's right, <laughs> trust me, I don't want God spitting in my eyes, okay? That's not going to be right ministry, but the truth, once again, you guys, the, the story of the day to start is that the Lord just cares so much about you that he wants to minister to you. And he wants to minister to me that intimately and that personally. That's what that's about. But of course it builds. Okay, so it says that he, let me read that again. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, verse 23, he asked him, do you see anything? Uh, of course, Jesus knew the answer. Jesus wasn't really like, God, I hope that worked. Hey, dude, do you, like, like, does that work already? Of course not. Okay, what's he trying to do at this point? Again, we've learned this lesson from the past, you guys, and that's this, to elicit your faith. Okay, process. Um, intimate, personal ministry. Hey, son, are you seeing anything? Hey, daughter, to get you back on track because your heart's been broken by that person, are you seeing something kind of unfold before you in this realm of righteousness or in this realm of my hand being upon you? And we're supposed to say yes. Why are we supposed to say yes? Because it elicits further faith. And this is the idea that you see right here. He goes, do you see anything? He goes, hey, son, you got the ball rolling in this faith thing? And what's he say? And he looked up and he said, I see dead people. No, he goes, I see, I better be careful here, okay? It's just, I came to me. He goes, he goes, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Now, uh, I doubt that the guy just kind of said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. I have a feeling that he was like a cheerleader or something. I'm thinking he's yelling it. I'm thinking he's screaming it. I think he's so happy, you know, I see, I see people. And uh, he's got to say, but they look like trees walking. You know, what's interesting, though, is that uh, what we understand is that this man once saw and that at some point in his life that he had become blind. Now, how, why, we don't know. We just know that this man was once able to see because of the way he describes this. I see men and I can tell you what they look like to me because I've seen these before. I see men, they look like trees, but you know, they're trees that happen to have legs and they're walking around. But praise the Lord because something's happening. That's the whole, that's the whole point there, you guys, is that something is, it's happening. Um, the process is moving. If you want to uh, remember what I started with, I said the truth. And I said, sometimes it, you know, he wants to get us there. It's something you sort of go towards. I, that's, that's a parallel. Right here, this process, it's in play thanks to the work of God and somebody saying, okay, I'll go for it. So again, he goes, I see people, yeah, but they look like trees walking. It says in verse 25, then Jesus laid his hand on his eyes again and he opened his eyes his sight was restored and he saw everything, and here's your key word, clearly. 
Telogos is the word there, and it comes from two words actually put together. And this is pretty significant, what the, what the words brought together are. One of them, in essence, means about as clear as clear can get. We, we say things like crystal clear, you know, ultra clarity. Now, here's the interesting part is the next word that this uh, gets attached to. It, the implication is that his clarity, his, the crystal clear vision isn't like, like, let's say Jesus is right here or something and you guys are right there and I'd be like, yeah, I can see them because I would be able to. But it would be, there is nothing in my sight that's blurry, like, like bar none. And the further implication is, it is that which is afar off. That which is in the distance of my, sight, my line of sight is as clear as that which is before me. This is what is so significant. I had never noticed this one really before because I didn't do that depth of study, but this actually means everything in my line of sight from here to as far as my eye can take me is as clear as clear can get. Let me tell you why that's so significant because obviously there's something depth, there's some depth spiritually into it. Uh, look, this is going to come up on the screen because I want you to just have this as a truth in your mind. The blind man's healing here. It's both physical, but the Holy Spirit definitely meant it to be a parable as well. Remember, a parable. It's a truth given to us in language we can understand. It's some theological truth given to you and I in language that we can understand. So this healing of this particular blind man is, yes, physical. It's a demonstration of the miracles of Jesus. But there's definitely something further. And you'll notice the word process. I didn't give you notes today, so you don't have anything to write, like fill in the blank. But the word that was key to me was process. It was a process that applies to all believers. When you were without Jesus... You were blind, right? Spiritually, you were blind. And then what do we sing in Amazing Grace? We say, I once was lost, I was found. We say, I was blind, but now, and the now means when you receive Jesus as your Savior, now I see. Here's the deal with what the Bible, how the Bible addresses this new vision of yours. That the, that clarity is a process, right? Can you think of those scriptures that basically teach that? When you become a Christian, things are new. You do have new vision. You do have a new realm that you see. You know, I was talking to somebody, I, I don't remember who it was, but how when, when Jesus is your savior, you get to look through Jesus' glasses. You get, to, you get to look from heaven's perspective on things, whereas before... You were blind to that stuff. You could only see the world from the world's perspective. Now, what the Bible teaches us is that when you do have the ability to see that spiritual truth, um, you're supposed to pursue it. It's supposed to be a process for you. You're supposed to no longer even want to see primarily the things of the world. What is uh, Colossians 3, 2? Set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. That is a sweeping commandment to all Christians. Hey, you have a different line of sight. It's supposed to affect every part of you. Set your minds on things that are above and not things that are on the earth. And, and you know, he's talking about that. He's saying Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. That's where, you know, that's what we're supposed to like take in and understand. But look at this, what Peter says in Ephesians. He goes, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation 
so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. You see the process? You see that there is something there before you, but the prayer always is keep pursuing that. You're going to see it here, but there's still a there to see. And it will be made clear to you one day. This is what we would call growth, spiritual growth. This is what we would call um, edification in the spirit. We would call this sanctification, which means, you know, becoming more and more like Jesus. Technically, sanctification means set apart, but still more and more like Jesus. The Bible uses the metaphor, you and I being pilgrims, doesn't it? We are pilgrims. We are supposed to have our eyes so set now on the line of sight that God has given to us. He says, you don't even people who are supposed to be there, really. You're just kind of there for now. But I always want you to make sure that you're looking the right way and remember that there's always more to be seen. And that's what needs to become clear to you. Pilgrims, what is it? He, he says, we're going towards something radiant. He says, he says, we're growing and we're going to see something that's there and it's a far off, but I'm telling you, it's there. He says, it's an inheritance that is imperishable. He says, uh, it's undefiled, it's unfading, and it's kept in heaven for us. And one day we will see that with complete uh, clarity. That's just an incredible part of the Christian life, isn't it? What a... What an amazing thing to behold. There is a horizon before you. It is set there before you by God. It's there. Whatever your life is, there is a horizon that God has set before you. And it's a marvelous thing. And God wants you to continue keeping your eyes forward and looking at it and pursuing it. He says, don't you worry because the clarity will come. And when you see it, wow. You want to know a great a great uh, set of verses for keeping that real from Jesus' point of view. One, I think that you guys are going to know. Matthew chapter 6, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, for the horizon that you set your eyes upon, there your heart will be as well. The Lord says, be heavenly minded. Boy, you could find like 20 verses, huh, that support all of that. He says, because in heaven are where your true blessings come from. He says, in essence, this, you have a, a treasure chest in heaven. And man, it's going to be there for you to open. But I'll tell you what, the more you do on this earth in terms of heavenly things, well, you're going to find that your treasure chest, it's just getting piled up. It's getting filled up. And there's going to be a day when you're going to get to, get to see it. You're going to get to receive it. You're going to get to be blessed by all of this stuff. Yeah, you know, maybe you have a nice house. Maybe you have a nice car. Maybe, you know, you got the cool clothes, whatever. But the Bible says very intentionally, these are temporary. Man, even these, these bodies of ours, praise the Lord that this one is <laughs> just a tent, that there will come one that's a lot better than this one. We get to put on immortality, huh? You guys, perspective from a Christian has to be so different. And it's got to be something that we show. It's got to be something that happens to us more and more and more. As you read the scriptures and you experience the blessings of God, may I say it like this, your vision is becoming clearer and clearer. And this is, you know, it's interesting that this miracle, this healing, it's the only miracle that happens in stages. Did you know that? It's the only time that Jesus ever does something and doesn't just finish it once and for all. He actually goes, hey, what do you see? Why? To elicit faith. Number two, 
to sort of give an idea of what life in Christ is like. You see, and then you get to see more, and then you get to see more, and then you get to see more. But you got to stay on that path. So Jesus has done it. Now comes the point where it's time for uh, the man to be sent away. Look, verse 26, it says that he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Hopefully we understand that now, right? Don't go into Bethsaida because even if they see you and your miracle, they're still going to go, oh, couldn't be, you know, because he's somebody special. So he goes, just ignore those guys and go home. Could, could you imagine that little family reunion? How amazing would that have been? Verse 27 is where Jesus now gets alone with his guys. It says, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. That's about 25 miles north now of where they were. It says, and on the way he asked his people... By the way, that's in the imperfect tense. And on the way, he kept on asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. Now, let me tell you more about the whole, the lesson I think the Holy Spirit gives us of this seeing having some clarity, but knowing that God's going to give you further clarity, that there's more there for us. This little section of scripture, Mark 8, 9, and 10, are specifically called, well, specifically, I throw this in there, the discipleship chapters, okay? You will notice that Jesus very specifically goes, hey guys, it's just you and me and maybe somebody else. But it's basically just you and me and maybe somebody else. And this is the time where he's investing himself into the lives of his guys because he knows his day's soon coming. And so what Jesus has to do, if you think about it this way, he needs to open their eyes because they don't get everything right now. There is much that is still confusing to them. I want you to think about a really cool little scriptural coincidence. So this area of Mark chapter 8 starts with Jesus healing a blind man in stages, right? Okay, the end, Mark chapter 10, that we call the discipleship section, it sort of, I'm going to say sort of ends with Jesus and his second healing of a blind man in the book of Mark. Uh, oh, by the way, in Mark that's the first healing on Jesus uh, recorded in the book of Mark for, for a blind man. So how cool is this? So Jesus starts the little discipleship section with the healing of a blind man and says, it's going to happen in stages. And then he kind of kind of ends that little section with the healing of a blind man, like bam, once and for all. And in the middle of it, he's working to give vision to his disciples. So he's got two miracles and sandwiched in between is basically the application of the miracles to the disciples. So he goes, oh, hold on just a second. This thing just turned off on me. Okay. So he goes, to, um, to, uh, goes with them to Caesarea Philippi. They cruise north 25 miles or so. And then he goes, hey, guys, who do you say or who do people say that I am? Now, if you know the Caesarea Philippi area, if you've ever been there or kind of studied it, here's what you would know. It was like spiritual chaos epicenter. Like this is a place where Caesar would have a statue. You know, Caesar uh, uh, would have been deified, meaning, you know, you worship Caesar. Uh, every year, some, you would take a, a pinch of incense and you would throw it on the statue and you would say, you know, Kaiser Curios, which means Caesar is Lord. And, well, you'd be called to worship him. That's why a lot of Christians were getting their heads chopped off. Because they said, I ain't taking that incense. I'm not throwing at any statue and declaring Caesar is Lord. I got Jesus. But there's no Caesar. What else in this Caesarea Philippi area? Well, there's 14 different temples. Um, big, 
significant Pan, you know, the, the god Pan, the, the half man, half goat played the flute, the Pan flute. That was a temple in that area. He was a biggie. Um, what else? It's kind of at the base of Mount Hermon, which is the tallest mountain in the Middle East. And it's also the place that is the source of the Jordan River. You know, that's like the big river in, in Israel. And that's where the water comes in to form the Jordan River. And so the Jews would even call this basically living water. So there was spiritual stuff everywhere. And it's so interesting that Jesus takes these, quote, blind guys. Okay, we're spiritual metaphor here takes him into the middle of spiritual chaos, and he goes, hey, guys, who do people say I am? Yeah, I know there's temples, and I know there's that statue over there, and there's living water coming all around us. Who do, uh, who do people say I am? And I dig their answer. I think their answers are pretty cool. Because... The, what it shows you is they were still trying to, I don't know, maybe protect the Lord. I, I don't know, I kind of see it like they, they didn't want to hurt the Lord's feelings. But on the other hand, I kind of like it because they were in essence telling Jesus, hey, Jesus, we don't fall for this junk around us. Basically, our ears are open to the real God. But let us tell you what people are saying about you. John the Baptist, right? Because John the Baptist was a, he was a super holy man. He was a wise man. He was just a powerful guy in God. So some people, I thought, must be John the Baptist. Uh, who else? Elijah? Is that who else he says? Oh, yeah, Elijah. I mean, Elijah called down fire from heaven. Maybe it was him because it does say in the Old Testament that Elijah would come. He said, some, they say, well, some people say that you're one of the prophets. You must be because you're like, you're really good at like telling the future. You're like kind of, oh, something like 100%. <laughs> and boy, you always work. And so they go, so, so what we recognize, Jesus, is that people are saying things about deities and spiritual and blah, blah, blah. But we know that the true God, uh, even people out there know that somewhere, somehow, the true God is involved. But isn't this, here, step away from that. How many people do you know who will say something like, yeah, Jesus must be a holy man. You got anybody in your family or friends who say that? They will acknowledge that Jesus was actually of the Lord. I have many, many in my family who will tell me that Jesus is of God, but they will tell me that he is simply one of. That's where you go, bummer, in this little section. But still, you get the idea now that Jesus is really challenging him, isn't he? He takes him to this place. He goes, okay, I want you to kind of think through your minds. What is the stuff you've been hearing about me? Okay, but here's the biggie. Basically, what comes next is you might say it this way, you guys. The entire gospel of Mark. I don't think this is an overstatement. Verse 29. That's just where it comes to. He goes, okay, okay, guys. But who do you say that I am? Jesus has been preparing these guys all the way through. We're six months away from Jesus' death. Some give or take. And so he's been taking them all the way through and he's been doing all this stuff and here he comes. He's taking them to the, disciple, the discipleship chapters. He's taking them to by themselves. He's performed amazing miracles. He's just opened the door to a stage, stage miracle. And then he challenges them. He goes, okay, guys, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Remember, I told you that Jesus has been asking them. And I think the reason why we're told in the original language that this has been an ongoing thing is because it indicates to you and to me that the guys were not sure. 
that they really did need to be kind of having some of those scales taken away from their eyes. They really tried, they really thought that they would know, but still they just couldn't quite get to it. Jesus goes, you guys, who have you been saying that I am? And, okay, here goes. Uh, our buddy Peter, of all the guys, right? What happens? He goes, okay. <clears throat> Jesus, you are the man. He goes, you are the Christ. Mishak, the first instance of Messiah in the Gospel of Mark. He goes, Jesus, you are the Messiah. And it's emphatic, by the way, the word you. It means you and nobody else but you are the Messiah. You are the promised one, Jesus. That's what I know. That's what, that's what we know. You are that one. You are the Holy One. You are the Son of David. You are the one that was prophesied. You are the one who's going to take the throne. You are the one who's going to free us from all of our oppression. You are the one who's going to do miracles. You are the one that's been spoken about since eternity past. You are the one. In Matthew's gospel, he actually is recorded also as saying, you are the Son of God. So it sounds like Peter's good to go. Um, it's, it's interesting that in the book of Mark, it's the shortest interaction that's recorded. Because like, for example, in the book of Matthew, here's what Jesus does. In Matthew chapter 16, he turns to, you know, to Peter and he goes, Simon, blessed are you. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Could you just see like, a, like an inflator to Peter's head? <laughs> Peter, dude, you nailed it, man. That's Matthew. You know what's an interesting little factoid here? Is that the book of Mark was written under Peter's direction, wasn't it? Because Mark was mentored by Peter. Basically, Peter's dictating this through Mark. That is conspicuously absent. The part where Peter kind of got the high five from Jesus, Peter said, hey, Mark, I don't even want you to put that in there. Just, just leave it out. But you're going to notice in just a second, he will record when Jesus rebukes Peter. He goes, get behind me, Satan. It's like, you talk about a pin in the balloon. Bam! And he goes, I, I want you, Mark, I want you to record that. But the other thing doesn't, it doesn't matter. And I think what's so cool about that, what? Is that humility? I think so. I think, you know, Peter, he takes it on the chin a few times. But the guy has allowed the Holy Spirit to do some amazing ministry in his years, huh? Just the real inspiration. You guys, we can do it. We're okay to live humbly. We're okay to live humbly, and God rewards us for our humility. Peter got rewarded, no doubt. Think about him right now in heaven with Jesus. Anyway, so let's continue on. Verse 30. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Some of your Bibles don't have strictly. Some of your Bibles would just say he charged them. And the reason why more modern translations say strictly is to let you know that the word chosen there was the most forceful word you could choose when demanding something. Okay, so Jesus intentionally chose a word that couldn't be more like authoritarian, couldn't be more forceful or commanding. He goes, do not tell anyone. Not, hey guys, you think you could keep your mouths kind of quiet? He goes, don't you dare tell anyone. How come? 
why, why does he pick the word above like five other possibilities? Because these guys, what did we say? They're, they're in the process. They gotta get there still. And the deal is that because they don't get the full picture of who Jesus is, if, if, if their version of Jesus gets out, it's gonna be utter chaos. I mean, how many times so far has Jesus had to leave crowd? Oh, wait a minute, let me change that. How many times have crowds left Jesus because he didn't meet their expectations? And Jesus goes, hey, guys, I know what you think about me. Do not tell anyone. So what we're going to see in the discipleship chapters, 8, 9, 10, he will be as specific and blunt about who he is as he can be. And they are going to hate it. Because the first thing we see recorded is that they hate it. Uh, you know the, Mount, uh, the Transfiguration, Mount uh, Transfiguration, when Jesus was up there and all of that happened and James and John and Peter, they're kind of coming down the mountain. And they're kind of like, yeah, oh. We just saw, we just saw it. Man, that's the scripture being fulfilled right there. You know, Elijah, he, they're thinking power. They're thinking like, this is it. We're about to get the, the, the Messiah we want. If you remember the story, you know what Jesus does? He goes, hey guys, don't tell anyone what you just saw. Same reason. You can't do it. And then he even adds this to the end. He goes, until the son of man has been raised from the dead. They didn't know about a son of man resurrection. See, the Jews, they would know of what's called a general resurrection. So can you imagine when Jesus goes, uh, until the son of man uh, gets raised from the dead, they're kind of like, okay, Jesus. And when the son of man, that's when we'll tell people. They just didn't get it. They have a lot to learn. So again, let's, let's remember this. Jesus intentionally chose the most forceful way to tell him, don't. Verse 31. Here comes. Here's that. I told you in chapters 8, 9, and 10, he's going to tell him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must. You want to talk about another one of them forceful, intentionally chosen words? There it is right there. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer Many, that's another underlined word. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Just stop there. And he said this pl plainly. <laughs> you understand their minds are blown. You understand they're like I'm seeing them go, La, 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 like they're shaking their heads. They're saying, Jesus, whoa, hold it now. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. That ain't the Messiah, Jesus. And we know you're the Messiah. So these two things, they're not lining up, Jesus. So could you, maybe they're going to be like, could you be quiet? Because it says in verse 32, and Peter took him and did what? Oh, Peter. He rebuked Jesus. Oh, uh, why? I just gave it away. Because G or Peter said, you are the Messiah. But their concept of the Messiah was way different than this, what, presentation of the Messiah? Like, do they even fit? And that's why Peter's like, Jesus, I don't even want to hear it. I think, you know what, dude? I'm a fisherman. Maybe I can teach you a thing or two, uh, Jesus. <laughs> Take a lesson from me. The Son of Man, mu I think must, must have killed him. Ugh. The Son of Man must suffer. When Jesus spoke to a man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3, here's what he told him. Uh, Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What's he talking about? His death. And here, Jesus is teaching the disciples, hey, I must. 
there's a calling, man. What did he do? Did he take him to Genesis 22 when Abraham offers Isaac? I, I, I don't know. Does he take him to Exodus where, you know, the blood of the lamb needs to be put on the doorpost so that death will pass over them? I don't know. What, did he take him to Psalm chapter 22 where it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he goes something like, you know what? Those are going to be my words in just a few months. I don't know. Does he take him to Isaiah 53? Oh, like, like that's one of the toughest chapters to read. I don't know if he does, but it's got to be in line with the word must. It can't be, hey, you guys, you know, I think. And so I just have, I just, it's just me. It says that he teaches them. Teach there is educate. He educates them. He teaches them. So they can't process it because Peter has just said, you are the Meshiach, you are the Messiah, you are the guy who's going to free us all from Rome and, you know, lay down the law and do all of your things. And it says Jesus has to rebuke him. Now we do know that eventually in the book of Acts, Peter gets it, right? Because he does actually tell this crowd about why Jesus had to die and then rise again. So there was a point, remember what we talked about when we started with you guys? There's a little clarity here, but the clarity continues forward, and it gets revealed to us. So we know that the Holy Spirit at one point ministered to Peter, but right here, he just wasn't digging the fact that the Son of Man must. And, oh, what about the fact that Jesus calls himself the Son of Man? You know where that comes from? Daniel chapter 7. You know who the Son of Man is in Daniel chapter 7? He's the one that the Father is going to give the kingdom to. He, the Son of Man is the one who's going to have dominion and glory and power and everyone will bow down to him. This is Jesus' favorite term for himself. So does this even make sense? He goes, um, the Son of Man, the one that you've always thought of as being the dude who's going to get it all, must get rejected and suffer and die. So it's really weird for these guys. He goes, they must. Must suffer. He starts with suffer. Oh, and by the way, the way he points suffer and reject and kill, they are like in their most negative forms. You know, you might say, oh, I, I stepped on a splinter and I kind of suffered. Ah, no, no, no. Suffering in this means somebody took a nail and drove it into my foot and I suffered. This, Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was spit on. He was whipped. He had his beard ripped out of his face. He had a crown of thorns nailed to his head. He had his own body nailed to a cross. That's the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah. And yet, you guys, I said Isaiah 53 can be tough to read sometimes. That's, that's the worst kind of suffering right there. It says that God laid on him the sins of every human being. Every Hitler, every murderer, every pornographer, every sinner. It says that that's going to, Jesus goes, I must. Peter later on, 1 Peter chapter 2, he himself bore our sins in our body on the tree. Huh, there's some clarity right there. By his wounds you have been healed. This is the same guy who said, no, Jesus, you're wrong. So these, the suffering would be beyond, you guys, suffering, when Jesus says suffering, let's just put it this way, we could never get it. And the guys didn't want to get it. He says, I'll be rejected. I must. Let's keep on using the word must. I must be rejected. Now, he's talking about the religious people. He's talking about their Pharisees. He's talking about their, you know, their, uh, the Sanhedrin, the 70. He's talking about all of those prominent men who are supposed to have influence over you. Uh, what were they? It's just self-righteous guys. They turned it all into something political. And, and so when they hear that Jesus is the Messiah, they don't want to hear about some Messiah that'll die for our sins. They want a Messiah just like Peter and these guys did. Man, he is going to come. He is going to take the foot of heaven and he is going to squash Caesar's head. That's what they wanted. And so when they learn that this guy just wants to forgive them of their sins, they say, you know what? Kill the guy. 
So these are the people that he's going to get rejected by, his own people. And then it says he must be killed. Again, you guys, killed means murdered to the, like the, the, the worst. Premeditated, horrific murder. Now we're getting it, huh, why these guys are saying no. Because Jesus doesn't just go, you know, I've got to get killed. He goes, it's got to happen, and it's going to happen in the worst way. And oh, yeah, I am the Messiah. Now, the part that they didn't hear was the very final part, obviously, where he goes, and after three days, rise up again. But wouldn't it have been so cool to, like, have another chapter or two say, hey, G wait a minute, okay, Jesus, what did you mean by that? And they have some dialogue. Doesn't that reflect us right there? Because sometimes you and I, we've got our little preconceived notions We've got our issues with the Lord. We've got our expectations with the Lord. And we pray and say, dear God, please. And God says, hey, I know what you need. You need me to spit in your eye right now. And we're like, okay, 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 you got to spit in my eye. But Lord, at least let me see way far in the beginning. And God says something like this. No, you let me spit in your eye now. And what you're going to see is you're going to see men like trees walking. And then you're going to start to notice something get better. And then you're going to see the end. And what we do is we stop right here and say, God, all you're going to let me do is see trees walking. It's so important for you and I to persevere in the faith. Because if we try to persevere in our own rationale, we're going to be like a fisherman trying to trump the Messiah. So, so, so okay, he told them, but they missed it. Final verse, verse 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, on the things of man. Did you see Jesus just tell him that? There it is. P uh, say, uh, Peter, let me tell you what Jesus isn't doing, okay? Jesus didn't just call Peter the devil. Jesus didn't just name Peter Satan. This is not what happens in this passage. I mean, it's a bummer to be Peter and Jesus looking at you and, and probably the way it was all set up, the guys would have been right back there. And, you know, he's looking at me, he goes, get behind me, Satan. Uh, here's the deal. Um, Jesus has heard this before. Jesus has heard the idea of messiahship without the must of eternity's plan. Do you remember where that was? It was in 40 days of temptation. Remember that? What happens? This Satan comes up to Jesus and he says, hey, you know what? I can give you dominion over the whole earth. Every kingdom here will be yours. All you got to do is bow down to me. He goes, he goes, just bow down to me. So in other words, he takes away the cross. He takes away the rejection. He takes away the suffering. And he goes, bam, you can have a straight course to messiahship. It's just that you got to get me in the program. And so when Jesus hears Peter say, no, 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 you can have dominion, but all this suffering must stuff, Jesus, get it out of here. Jesus goes, whoa. Hey, Peter, you don't even know who's influencing you right now. And he sort of calls back and he says, get behind me, Satan. This is the reference from a personal experience that Jesus has with somebody who's telling him the same thing. I think you have Peter, who right now is a weak fisherman, and he's getting influenced by the enemy. Now, Jesus recognizes it, but Jesus had to... Man, he had to put his foot down. Remember how important this is, you guys. They got to know who he is. No cross, no suffering, no Messiah. No shedding of blood for sins, no forgiveness. That means everybody in hell. Get behind me, Satan. There's a plan that my father and I put together. The Holy Spirit, we put this plan together so that every man and every woman has the opportunity to be saved. And if I don't go through that process step by step by step by step, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be dead. So he has to just kind of uh, make something clear. Just, just that first part. And sometimes it's got to be harsh, you guys. Sometimes when you and I pray and sometimes when we go before the Lord, you know what we do? 
We try to rule God. And God's got to say back to us, you know what, get behind me, Satan. And you know what that reference means now. Be, be very uh, moldable. I just love that metaphor of the wet clay. Just let the Lord mold you. And if it's in the shape that you don't like, just say, Lord, even though I don't like it, I'm going with it. Lord, right now, the trajectory of my life, I do not like it. Lord, this job, I can't believe you put me in this job. Lord, this is the only way I have to make money, and this is what you gave me? No. Jesus has a plan for your life. Lord, this is what you gave me in my family. This is what I'm supposed to be enduring. God, hold it here. And Jesus says, yeah, this is what I have. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stay faithful. I know that right now all you can see is men walk, or trees, men as trees walking. I know that. But I want you to take my promise, which is this. There is something more. You stay fixed to the truth. And you stay uh, straight to the path. And you will keep, uh, and you will uh, find the, the treasure chest full. These are the discipleship chapters that have to be taught to the boys. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, and God is able. God is able. That was the big part to me. God is able. I would have just put those words, but I like the rest of the verse. God is able to make grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Psalm 55, 22. Hey, Peter, don't you worry about things. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will, I will, sustain you. I will never allow righteousness to be shaken. I will never compromise. Peter, don't you ever worry. I will never take the shortcut. I will do things righteously. I will do things according to the Father. You need to as well. Proverbs 16 says, commit your life to God and he will establish your plans. There is verse after verse. You guys, what a great devo. Just check out all the times where God says, I know, I know, but just stick to me. There must be 50. So I could have picked so many verses but, but that's the life of God's people. So let's kind of close it up with that concept, okay, with that thought. What was it? We know that um, the people of God have something laid out before them by God. So they should be joy-filled. It says, man, you got, a, you got a mansion waiting for you. But not just that. If you stay faith-filled, you stay true to what you can see right now, you will advance to the next stage and you will see how it kind of, you know, kind of builds, kind of works. And you will see that happen more and more and more as time goes on. Think about Peter when he realized that Jesus needed to die. He's there and the Holy Spirit falls upon him. He goes, ladies and gentlemen, listen. And he says he's preaching to like 3,000 people, or more than that. Um, did Peter know everything at that time? No. No, he still had to learn, like you could eat anything. He had to learn some other truths. That's the truth that you and I pick up on. Hey, take it now, and then you'll get more, and then you'll get more. What's the second part? You're going to do it God's way. In other words, you don't argue with God because he is God. You yield to the Lord. So you ask yourself, what's going on in my life right now that I hate? If you're being a man or a woman of faith and righteousness, okay, that's your key. If you're in sin, forget it. That's another issue. But if you're following after righteousness and these troubles are, have come upon you, then what are you supposed to do? You stay faith-filled. You know that God has a plan for you that's going to be greater than you can think or ask. Um, what else? You have to be very humble. These men would have to turn out to be very humble because of all that Jesus was teaching them. 
You guys, if we want to live a fruitful life for Christ in this world, we have to do it humbly. We have to do it by saying this, not me, but you, God. Not by my power, my strength, but your power and your strength. Lord, I know that you've put me in a <laughs> heck of a position. The only way I'm going to prevail here is through your power. Okay? God's got something for us. Trust him. And then humbly follow. Let's pray.